Hi everyone, this is Mr. Hall, and this is just a quick video about chromatography in specific about the method. Um, I'll do another video a little bit later on about how you interpret the results, but for this video today, I just want to focus on how you do chromatography, the issues and the potential pitfalls of chromatography, and sometimes how you deal with some of the results that you get. So in terms of the outcome for today's session, what I want to focus on is to describe the key steps in the method of chromatography, to explain how chromatography can separate mixtures, that comes up quite a lot in exam questions, and also to identify problems with chromatography methods that you may do. So first off, in terms of the key steps of chromatography, now this isn't often asked a great deal um, in depth in exam questions. Some bits are more than others, mainly because it's really straightforward to explain. I've got a diagram here, um, which shows basically how it is set up in a school um, setting. When you get onto A-level and beyond, obviously you do much more sophisticated versions of this, but um, at school, you're likely to have like a pencil with a bit of fills paper wrapped around it and some ink um, spotted on it. So in terms of uh, the steps that you need to mention in your method, the first thing you have to do is you have to draw a horizontal pencil line. Now, I've written here about 1.5 centimetres above the bottom. It doesn't really matter um, how high it is in terms of how specific you put it in your exam question. You could write two centimetres or one centimetre. 1 1.5 is generally fine or an inch. Either's OK. And it has to be on a filter paper. You could um, also call it chromatography paper, or if you want to really, really fancy, call it a chromatogram. Um, but either's fine, to be honest. And then uh, you have to place your dots of ink to be tested. Now, usually chromatography is used to kind of work out what is in an ink that you don't know what's inside it. And then chromatography can separate the different parts of that ink. So you have to put the dots of ink that you want to test. Um, and usually it's an unknown dye and then some known dyes that you suspect may be inside it. Uh, typically in a sort of chemistry lab, whether it's key stage three or key stage four, you'll have I don't know, red, yellow, and then maybe the unknown will be like green or something. Something it usually happens like that. All right. Then you have to place the filter paper in one centimeter uh, of solvent. Now the solvent is usually water. Sometimes you'll have a mixture where the dots and the inks are insoluble in water, in which case you have to use a different solvent, usually ethanol. So just be aware that sometimes the solvent may be different. Then you have to you have to literally write that the solvent will separate the different dyes again. Then you have that nice spectrum of colors um, that you get from this whole process. And then what you have to do, and this is something which, which you do have to mention in your method, you have to say the dyes can be compared to known chromatograms for known dyes. And the way you do that is you calculate or compare RF values or distances moved. You can then see which uh, have identical or different components inside them. Now, you just have to state that, and I'll talk more about how you do those uh, calculations and comparisons later. But the key thing for you to write down when you're writing down the method is that idea that you do do that comparison either from distances moved or RF values, it doesn't really matter, but you do have to mention those. So that's the first bit. Those are the key steps of chromatography. It gets asked sometimes, you just gotta be, uh, be aware of that. The second thing is common errors of chromatography. So sometimes what they'll ask you, because the method's so straightforward, they'll have to find ways of testing your understanding. And one of the ways they test your understanding is showing you a flawed method or a bad method and saying, right, what is wrong with this? And either be in writing or be in a diagram. Now, as you can see here, I've got a diagram of someone who uh, is a very confused student and doesn't really know how to set the whole thing up. Um, and from here, you can see there are a number of errors that the student has done. Now, you need to be able to do two things. First off, identify what those errors are. And secondly, you need to explain why they're bad, why they're a problem. So in this particular diagram, you can see that the start line is drawn in ink, not pencil. That's really bad because then what will happen is that the ink will dissolve into the solvent and it'll mix up with all the dyes that you're testing. So you'll just have this splurge of color and it won't be very good. Okay, So that's a problem. So you always have to draw in pencil, not pen. Second error is that they used an incorrect solvent. Sometimes this happens. Now you can see in this particular uh, method, water is used. Sometimes they'll say in the text at the beginning, oh, A, B, C, D, and X are insoluble in water, but they are soluble in ethanol. So you do have to read the information as long as as, uh, as well as the diagram, just to make sure that you've got that detail absolutely spot on, all right? And then sometimes the spots of dye are done under the solvent. Now you can see here that the line with the spots is under the solvent line. That's rubbish because as soon as you put it in, it's all gonna dissolve in the water and nothing's gonna spread up the paper. So ideally you want to specify the distance that the solvent's at and the distance that your solvent line is at or the pencil line. So as you remember from my last slide, I said the pencil line is at 1.5 centimeters. So it's good bet to say that the water should be at one centimeter. Okay, and that's, that's basically what you, what you need to do. So these are the three most common errors. They might throw one or two others at you, which I haven't seen before, but these are the three most common. And then finally, you need to explain 
why they separate in the first place. Okay, so you've got these dots. Um, and as you do your chromatography, you'll get a nice chromatogram. If you look at the bottom right of your screen at the moment, you can see that one dot may spread into a red dot, a yellow dot, and a green dot. In truth, your chromatogram might look very different. It'd be like a massive spectrum of color, which is quite hard to analyze. That we'll discuss later, but you need to understand why different colors go different distances. So the first thing to remember is that different components of a mixture have different solubilities, all right? So in this particular chromatogram I've got, I've got a red dot and a yellow dot and a green dot, which are all in one mixture. Now, what this is showing me is that the red is of a different solubility to the yellow, which is of a different solubility also to the green. Now, the different components of a mixture have different forces of attraction to the stationary and mobile phase. Now, I haven't mentioned stationary and mobile phase quite at the moment. The stationary phase is the one that is stationary, okay? And the phase that's stationary here is your chromatography paper. The mobile phase is the thing that moves, okay? Now, in this, it's the, the solvent that's moving up the chromatography paper. So your stationary phase is your paper, your mobile phase is your water. Now, if you look at this particular example, if you are more soluble, you're more likely to be in the mobile phase, which means you're going to move further. Now, using that logic, we can see green has moved by far the furthest up the chromatography paper. So that means that the green must be the most soluble. It also has the weakest force of attraction to the stationary phase because it's able to leave it quite easily and travel up the paper. In contrast, let's have a look at red. Now, red is way down at the bottom, quite close to, the, to where the pencil line was. That must mean it's not very soluble because it didn't dissolve a great deal in the water to travel up through the mobile phase. And then the yellow is kind of in between. So as I just mentioned, a substance that isn't very soluble will have a strong source of attraction to the stationary phase. In this particular case, the one that's not very soluble is the red one. So it's got a very strong force of attraction to the stationary phase and a weak force of attraction to the mobile phase. As a result, the different components, they're going to move up the paper at different speeds. Okay, so you can see the green moves up the quickest because it's the furthest after a set amount of time, followed by the yellow. And the one that's really slow is the red one. Okay, in exam questions, you do have to mention they move up at different speeds or rates. They do like seeing that um, in, in examination answers. And because they're different speeds and rates, they'll travel um, different distances within a set amount of time. OK, well, I hope that's been very useful. The next video I'm going to do is going to be more about how you analyze the results that you've got. OK.